Hello and welcome to Inspire, Teach, Excel, the podcast where we talk about teaching and ideas around teaching. I'm Emily Jubatoni, the director of BCTSA Skit, and great to have you with us. Today's strategy that we're talking about is comparative marking, an approach where, in theory, you can do you can mark 90 essays in 90 minutes, a much faster way of marking essays. And what I'd like to think about today is why this approach works, what it looks like in practice, and maybe dispel some myths about it. Uh, it's very hard, easy to be kind of swept up in the headlines about this approach um, and the kind of gut instinct of that's not how people should mark. We should mark one essay at a time, one, do one, that's to one side, do another one. But actually, this approach can be much better and we'll explore why today. Comparative marking as an approach takes us away from a, a system which really, when you're marking essay-based subjects, there is some evidence out there, you can read a lot about this in the work uh, of Daisy, Daisy Christodoulou, that longer essay-based tasks, when teachers mark them, when teachers assess them, they can be discriminatory against disadvantaged pupils and have giant workload for teachers, which does have an impact in the classroom because every time that teachers are working on marking, they're not actually giving that one-to-one -one teaching and care that you want in the classroom. They're not having time to think about that classroom environment, which is where the core of the learning is taking place. The other thing about essay-based tasks is they are fiendishly difficult to mark reliably. And that's a quote from Daisy Christodoulou that I really like because it's so accurate. Fiendishly hard to mark reliably. If you get two markers and they look at the same English essay at GCSE, there will always, always be a debate about what the accurate mark is. Likely not a wide debate. People are not debating, is that an A star or is it a D grade? Is that a grade nine or is it a grade three? But about the precision of the marks, you know, is this a 24 or a 26 out of 30? That kind of level, really, really difficult to do. Why? Is that such a problem? Well, because the mark schemes for essay-based subjects don't have that precise mark scheme that you might get in a short answer mark maths question where the answer is this. The mark scheme will often use language like, for this range of marks, it is clear. For this range of marks, it is some success. For this range of mark, it is confident. And we call these bands that pieces of work have to be placed into. into. And obviously those words are open to interpretation. And while teachers can give students some little shortcuts, they could give students phrases that they think would put them in a clear response, those phrases in theory are infinite and every, different teachers in the classroom next to each other will have different strategies for that. And a student might ignore all their strategies and use their own strategy and their own way of explaining something. And the teacher has to decide, is that clear? Is that consistent? Is that some success? Which of these bands does it fit into? There's a lot of problems with that and they are not problems with teachers. They are problems just because we're all human beings. One of them, the human bias of knowing your students. If you know that your student consistently does this kind of uh, level of work, without being able to acknowledge that, you are more likely to think their work is roughly going to be in this area. If you know a student really struggles with the subject, you're more likely to be biased and thinking what that, um, that that student might do less well. There's bias in knowing what you taught. If you gave the students some strategies and said, if you use these strategies, you are likely to get a grade in the clear range, and then the student uses that strategy, you're likely to be like, oh, brilliant, I'll put them in the clear range. I taught them that and they've used it, there we go. But actually, you need to read around that. Have they used it exactly like, they, like you told them to do? Are they getting that mark just because they've copied a phrase you gave them or is it really about their understanding being clear some people are naturally generous or naturally harsh with their marking and when i say some people i mean all people all teachers when marking naturally fall somewhere on that spectrum and there's loads of different ways to meet a mark scheme for an essay based subject there is no one way of writing an essay and while teachers give students approaches that might help you've always got to interpret what a student has written and try and work out okay they've done it in this way is that clear or is that consistent or is that some success where does it go so there's a lot of problems when we're marking essay based subjects so let's see why this approach helps with this approach of comparative marking what you do really simply is you focus on comparing two bits of work at a time 
and you are focusing on getting the rank order of your class right. So you start with your one essay that you look at the mark scheme and think, right, I think it's about here. It's in this band. It's maybe clear. Look at the next essay. If you think it's better, you put it on the pile to the right of your table. If you think it's not quite as good, put it in the pile on the left. And you keep doing that and maybe you're aiming for and you're constantly just comparing two essays, just the one before and the one after, maybe about five piles. Why do I think five piles is a good idea? Because if you think about the range of marks you're likely to have in a class, it's very rarely a range of more than 15. If you've got a 0 to 30, I'm an English teacher, you might have a 0 to 30 mark A-level essay. Out of 30 in a class, very typically... The lowest mark might be 15 and the top mark might be 25. You're not going to have a range of 30 marks. So within a range of, say, 10 marks, maybe a few more marks, five piles gives you a really good kind of um, rank order across there, where you might have some marks that are 15, a 17, a 19, a 21, a 23, you know, kind of got, getting this range in there. Once you've got your piles, once you've got your kind of... Um, different bands you can then check those for consistency and again you're not looking at an individual student's name you're trying to take that bias out of knowing the students what you're looking for now is just consistency in the pile so you're going down the pile really quickly and going are these all of the quality i'm going to come back to a daisy christadulu quote here that um she talks about the reason it works is it offers a really good strategy for measuring the tacit knowledge of the teacher. That the teacher, as an expert in the subject, will have an understanding of, quote, what quality looks like, even if it's not possible to define that quality in words. That is the tacit knowledge of an expert teacher. And what you're doing there is saying, every child in this group could have approached this question in a different way my expert knowledge of the teacher, I am now checking all the ones in this pile, although they've approached it in a different way, is the quality of what they're doing the same. You could, if you then wanted to, go within a band and, you know, you've got a band, that, a pile that represents maybe a range of three marks. You could then delve into that a little bit more and be like, OK, well, we've got the top mark, which is 17, 8, and then we've got a 16, and then we've got a 15, and you could do that. But I wouldn't advise it. I would think within that, part of this is about speed and accuracy and the reliability of what you are trying to mark here. Exam boards often do a strategy called double marking, two people marking a script. That is untenable for schools. We do not have the workload, the manpower to do that. But that's just a different strategy for checking the quality. Personally, I always, when I'm marking a set of exam papers, pick a top, middle and bottom and share them with another teacher and double mark just those ones, just to check that I'm right. And then I can go back and almost always, and in fact always, those marks are within what an exam board would call tolerance. Exam boards say, taken from AQA's website, this little quote, that there are small acceptable differences in professional judgment in the marking of essay based subjects. They call this tolerance, that you have to have tolerance that not every essay will be marked bang on the exact mark because what is the exact mark? We are looking at a kind of, we're looking at this language of clear, consistent, and that is, it's not precise terminology. So when exam boards talk about small acceptances and differences in professional judgment, if you as a teacher have a difference between um, a 17 and an 18 mark between two essays that are very, very, very similar, that is an acceptable difference in the accuracy of your marking. That is the tolerance of your marking. If you had a, a, a variation of eight marks, I'd be concerned, but not that small tolerance mark scheme. A couple of the myths about this. So the myth that it's less accurate, I think hopefully what I've shared there, a little bit of that research and background is actually, this is when you've got a lot of essays, more accurate than sitting down and working through one at a time, one at a time. I've come across some schools who have a, an approach where they say you must always work, mark pupil premium work, uh, the work of pupil premium students first. And why do they do that? Because over time we get tired and we get sloppy and our biases come out a little bit more and we just have less accuracy and precision in our toolkit. This is not about saying let's have more accuracy at the start. It's saying let's have more accuracy 
for all of our students in the classroom. And I think this is a much better strategy for being accurate in your marking. There might be a myth, a myth that this is about lazy teachers, which I think would be completely outrageous approach and a total misunderstanding of this strategy. Comparative marking is not about teachers being lazy. It's about teachers using their professional expertise and their deep skill to be more precise in what they're doing with students. And yes, maybe it takes a little bit of bravery, but that is not to say that it's not the right thing to do. And finally, might, there might be a myth that this isn't about progress, you know, individual students getting that, like you've written every little bit over the paper. But actually, if we look at research on feedback, that is not the best quality of feedback anyway. Feedback is about helping students know where they are and what they need to do to, uh, to progress. And doing whole class feedback, doing things where you actually are talking to the students about their response does not, in any research paper I've ever seen, say that you need to cover every individual essay with loads and loads of red pen. That's not the best strategy for feedback. And there's lots of other strategies you can use. Not that I'm going to cover them in this podcast, um, but there are many, many better things out there. So... If you want to talk more about comparative marking, do drop us something in the comments. This is a uh, really great strategy, really support it. There's loads of research you can dig into. Thank you so much for listening. This is slightly longer than normal podcast, and hopefully we'll see you again in future podcasts.